Hello friends, uh, I am Dr. Ajay Adha. So today we will discuss uh, high yield questions for FMG uh, 2022. Actually, uh, unfortunately looking at the trends of last year few questions, I would like to say uh, the questions of uh, anesthesia in particular uh, has uh, the difficulty level of the anesthesia questions I will say has increased. So anyway, the questions which I prepared are based on the FMG questions asked over the last uh, few years plus which I feel is more important in upcoming exams. So without wasting any time, let's uh, straight away start with question number one. A sick patient in wards needs supplemental oxygen. It will be given from which of the following cylinder? So uh, you can see the choices A, B, C and D. So important about cylinders is to know the color. Color is very very important not only from questions point of view but from clinical point of view also because only by identifying the color you can identify a cylinder. So color is not only important from questions point of view it is also very important from clinical point of view and very often questions related to color of cylinders has been asked. So, uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, first discuss the color. Uh, so, color of cylinders, let's start on this page. It has more space. So, most commonly used is uh, oxygen cylinder. So, color of oxygen cylinder is black body. with white top or white shoulders. So black body with white shoulders. Nitrous oxide is stored in blue color cylinders. Then another cylinder that is commonly used is Antonox, which is a mixture of 50% oxygen plus 50% nitrous oxide. So since it is a mixture of oxygen and nitrous oxide, so the color defined is blue body with blue and white top or you can say blue and white shoulders. So blue body and blue quadrants indicating uh, nitrous oxide, white wild shoulders indicating oxygen. Then air is usually supplied uh, uh, or forget about air. I think air is supplied through central supply. So you don't need, no need to go in those details. Only one cylinder you can remember is carbon dioxide which is not used in anesthesia. However, you will see carbon dioxide cylinders uh, commonly placed in OT uh, because they are used for gas insufflation for laparoscopy. So carbon dioxide is stored in grey color cylinders. So I think that is uh, more than enough for you to remember otherwise color of helium heliox or uh, air i don't think that you need to remember so these four or particularly these three i will say oxygen nitrous oxide and antonox that you must remember so oxygen black body with white shoulders nitrous oxide blue antonox blue body with blue and white shoulders and carbon dioxide stored in gray color cylinders now we can look at the question patient need oxygen means we have to identify the oxygen so this is oxygen black body with white shoulders. So answer is A. And of course this is nitrous oxide blue body and this is antonox I told you blue body with blue and white shoulders and this is carbon dioxide which I told you is used for gas insufflation during laparoscopic surgeries. And other than uh, color Second thing about cylinder that you have to know is the pressure because pressure is also frequently asked. Uh, <clears throat> now pressure regarding pressure there are so many units being used in different countries uh, Pascal, kilopascal, m bar, uh, psi, atmosphere, kilogram per centimeter square and again in books also you will be uh, you will see that there are many units being mentioned. But of course, you need not remember about other countries. You have to only remember about India. And in India, the two units which are used are kilogram 
per centimeter square and pounds per square inch or we say psi so you can even remember uh, one unit and you remember the conversion factor so that if required you can always convert so one kilogram per centimeter square is equal to 14.5 psi so one kilogram per centimeter is equal to 14.5 psi so if by chance they ask you question in uh, kilogram per centimeter square and uh, you know in the psi so you can always convert by this conversion factor so in a full oxygen cylinder the pressure is 2000 pounds per square inch which is roughly around you can say 139 or 138 kilogram per centimeter square okay nitrous oxide the pressure is 760 pounds per square inch and antonox is 2000 psi and I don't think you need to remember about carbon dioxide because that is no more used in anesthesia. So it's simple to remember oxygen and antonox 2000 psi. And why antonox has 2000 psi? Because it has oxygen. And that's a general rule of physics that if you mix two gases with different pressures, the combination will always exhibit the pressure of higher gas. That is why antonox is exhibiting the pressure of oxygen that is 2000 psi. Fine. So these are the two very important thing about cylinder you have to remember, color and pressure. Now let's see next question. And in fact, this question also has been asked with a little twist in your exam. Uh, COPD patient in ICU was on oxygen therapy with mask with two liters of oxygen. He was found to be hypoventilating. His PCO2 in on blood gas analysis was 64 mmHg. Which of the following should be done? Increase the FiO2, decrease the FiO2, start BiPAP, intubate and start on ventilator. Now, uh, this is a little ICU question. Uh, so, I'll little uh, hide. But in fact, I told you that this question is not new. It has been asked in your FMG exam. So, uh, patient COPD. 2 liters of oxygen and now is retaining carbon dioxide PCO2 has increased how much is the normal PCO2 40 so it has become 64 because patient is hypoventilating so you can say that this patient of COPD is in type 2 respiratory failure you know what is type 1 respiratory failure that is uh, <coughs> type 1 is because of the decreased uh, oxygen and type 2 is because of increased carbon dioxide. So type 1 is hypoxic respiratory failure and type 2 is hypercapnic respiratory failure. So this patient is in type 2 respiratory failure. Now you very well know that the COPD patients, they cannot tolerate high oxygen they survive on hypoxic drive that you very well know so we have to use them fio2 as low as possible so that's what is being done only two liter of oxygen so if you increase this oxygen if you increase this oxygen hypoxic drive will go and patient is already hypoventilating so he he may go in arrest so therefore, increasing FiO2 does not arise. And secondly, patient is hypoventilating, CO2 is building, already 2 liter is almost nil. So there is no question of decreasing FiO2 also. Then a very good option, we have left with two options, either intubate or start on BiPAP. So for type 2 patients, type 2 respiratory failure patients BiPAP must be tried because majority of the patients they come out with BiPAP now what is BiPAP I think many of you would have used uh, this BiPAP machine this BiPAP as the name suggests bi-level positive airway pressure that means it will deliver two pressures one high pressure 
एंड वन लो प्रेशर प्रेशर हाई और प्रेशर लो वी से इट सो वॉट इज द एडवांटेज ऑफ हाई प्रेशर हाई प्रेशर मीन्स वेंटिलेटर इज जनरेटिंग इनफ प्रेशर सो दैट पेशेंट कैन मेंटेन द डिजायर टाइडल वॉल्यूम सी टू टेक इंस्पिरेशन वी नीड टू जनरेट प्रेशर एंड दिस पेशेंट इज हाइपो वेंटिलेटिंग मीन्स दिस पेशेंट नीड ड्राइव टू इंक्रीज हिज टाइडल वॉल्यूम so that is given by high pressure so the high pressure is given during inspiration so that is why we called it as inspiratory pressure so this is given during inspiration to increase the tidal volume or you can say to attain the desired tidal volume so this way you will provide adequate ventilation now normally why we give low pressure low pressure is expiratory pressure normally what happens during expiration alveoli collapses and there is no gas exchange which is taking place during expiration so if you give positive pressure during expiration gas exchange will take place even during expiration because alveoli will always remain open so they are not collapsing even during expiration so gas exchange will take place even during expiration so that is why and this is called as p that is positive and expiratory pressure and if it is given to a spontaneously breathing patient then we call it as cpap continuous positive airway pressure cpap so if we give peep to a if we give positive pressure at the end of expiration to a intubated patient we call it as peep if we give uh, the same peep to a spontaneously breathing patient we call it as cpap continuous positive airway pressure so this lower pressure is the expiratory pressure or in fact this is cpap because bipap is given through mask although bipap given can be given through a intubated patient but here we are not intubating the patient we are giving through mask we will not intubate these patients immediately first we will try to achieve their oxygenation and wash out their carbon dioxide by with mask with mask so we are giving this bipap mask we are using this bipap mask so the best is of course we have increased so by increasing the tidal volume what we have done if we increase the tidal volume so we will increase the minute volume because minute volume is tidal volume into respiratory rate so minute ventilation will wash out this increase minute ventilation will wash out this carbon dioxide so carbon dioxide will be decreased and cpap i told you will increase oxygenation so we should try bipap in this patient yes after a trial of bipap majority almost all patients will benefit but you see after 1 hour or 2 hour you repeat a blood gas analysis and you see that patient co2 is building or patient is even becoming more drowsy then of course that means patient is not responding to your bipap then in that case we will intubate the patient fine Question number three: A young patient underwent surgery under GA with oxygen nitroxide and desflurane. Just after extubation, the patient started to desaturate. On auscultation, there are crepitation. What can be the most common cause? Pleural effusion, ARDS, negative pressure pulmonary edema, atelectasis. And again, this question, in a little different way, has again been asked in your FMG. And in fact, two times they have asked in different ways. so patient was given ga and with desflurane desflurane you know has got irritant effect on airways its induction or you can say uh, its effect on airways is irritating one thing you have to keep in this mind so what happened just after extubation the patient started to desaturate 
and on auscultation there were crepitations so this happens due to laryngospasm and i don't know why for fmg exams laryngospasm is a very favorite topic i told you at least two or three times i have seen question on laryngospasm in one way or the other and laryngospasm happens at the time of extubation or just after extubation the most common cause of laryngospasm is actually secretions so secretions irritate the larynx and larynx goes in spasm and here desflurane has got irritating <coughs> effect on airways so obviously airways are hyper reactive and due to irritation there will be more production of secretions so incidence of laryngospasm will be higher with desflurane so that again uh, goes in a favor of <coughs> laryngospasm so this patient developed laryngospasm larynx goes in spasm laryngospasm is really a life threatening complication if not managed immediately and it is not so infrequent we do often see laryngospasm so best way to prevent laryngospasm is that you should drain out the secretions before extubation and i think some of you if you had worked in ot would have seen that we thoroughly do the suctioning and then only we extubate the patient but if it happens then the treatment is you can give a strong positive breath positive pressure ventilation because sometimes this positive pressure ventilation will push uh, this mucus plug and laryng uh, laryngospasm may be relieved but very often not then you can give a small dose of a short fast acting muscle relaxant that is succamethonium so succamethonium you know is fast acting muscle relaxant it will relieve laryngospasm within 30 seconds so you can give a small dose of succamethonium <coughs> now one of the very big consequence of laryngospasm that is why i said laryngospasm should be managed immediately otherwise what will happen that laryngospasm if patient develop laryngospasm and try to take breath so if you take a breath against a closed glottis what will happen there will be negative pressure created and that negative pressure will <coughs> lead to pulmonary edema so one of a very big consequence of laryngospasm is negative pressure pulmonary edema so that is what has happened in this patient patient started to desaturate just after extubation means it is laryngospasm and you are hearing crepitations that means patient has developed pulmonary edema so it is negative pressure pulmonary edema so that is why laryngospasm should be treated immediately so that patient doesn't develop pulmonary edema otherwise you know laryngospasm is an acute problem once you give succamethonium it is relieved and then you do thorough suctioning remove <coughs> suction patient will be okay but if patient develop pulmonary edema then <coughs> there is very high possibility uh, that uh, patient recovery will take many hours or patient may then uh, <coughs> need to be ventilated in icu question number 4 <coughs> which of the following anesthetic agent is best for cardiac patients halothane isoflurane nitrous oxide sevoflurane for cardiac patients beyond any second thought isoflurane because it minimally decreases the cardiac output so isoflurane <coughs> minimally decreases the cardiac output that is why inhalational agent of choice for cardiac patients so let's uh, take this opportunity to uh, discuss different agent for different conditions so you can say system or inhalational agent cardiac patients cardiac system if patient is suffering from cardiac disease i told you inhalational agent of choice is 
isofluorine respiratory respiratory means i'll say mainly asthma or copd respiratory inhalation agent of choice is copd why because it causes maximum bronchodilatation while isofluorine i told you minimum decrease in cardiac output so all inhalation agent decreases cardiac output isofluorine also but least compared to other agents for liver patients hepatic patients again sevoflurane why because minimum decrease in hepatic blood flow so all inhalation agent that decreases hepatic blood flow but sevoflurane minimal and then for renal patients desflurane why because it does not produce fluoride on metabolism uh, you know that inhalation agents by producing fluoride can cause nephrotoxicity so desflurane does not produce any fluoride so cardiac patients because that frequently asked so you should know for cardiac patients inhalation agent of choice is isofluorane for respiratory sevoflurane for hepatic again sevoflurane for renal desflurane so this is devas cardiac so it will be isofluorane question number 5 <laughs> which of the following structure is not encountered during epidural anesthesia supraspinous intraspinous ligamentum flavum dura this if you ask me i will say the most favorite question of fmg which structures are not encountered when you are giving a spinal or epidural i think at least 3 or 4 times it has been asked so this will <coughs> will go in little detail so these are spines these are lamina and these are spinous processes so we are obviously entering from posterior side and say this is anterior so when we are giving spinal or epidural we are entering from the posterior side so first to encountered will be skin then below skin all you know is this you can say subcutaneous tissue then is the supra spinous ligament supra spinous ligament connecting the tip of spinous processes then is the interspinous ligament intraspinous connecting the spinous processes then is the ligamentum flavum which you know is called as uh, <coughs> yellow ligament of the body ligamentum flavum then is the dura and then is the arachnoid and you know there is no actually subdural space there is no subdural space so as soon as you pierce the dura you automatically also pierce the arachnoid so spinal anesthesia 
is given in subarachnoid space means between arachnoid and pia so here will be pia because csf is present in subarachnoid space that is arachnoid and pia now where is epidural anesthesia given outside the dura so epidural anesthesia is given outside the dura outside the dura means between dura and ligamentum flavum here between dura and ligamentum flavum so just to summarize when giving spinal anesthesia structures encountered first is skin and why i'm telling this because this is the question which i am seeing successively three times asked with different uh, uh, questions but the same question with different language you can say successively three times i have seen this question in your fmg so you have to remember first to encounter is skin then subcutaneous tissue then supraspinous ligament then interspinous then ligamentum flavum then dura and then arachnoid if they ask you epidural then obviously skin subcutaneous tissue supraspinous ligament it is interspinous ligament and ligamentum flavum after ligamentum flavum uh, you will get the epidural space so here what they have asked which of the following structure is not encountered during epidural supraspinous we do interspinous we do ligamentum flavum we do dura obviously we do it in we will puncture in spinal not epidural so d a clinical case a 65 year male with a history of mi 2 years back for which he was managed conservatively is to be operated by laparoscopic cholecystectomy last echo shows ejection fraction of 60% he is on regular treatment since then question number 6 and 7 are applicable to this situation so it's a 65 year male mi done means had mi 2 years back and that was managed conservatively means no stenting was done and now he is posted for laparoscopic surgery however if you see the latest echo ejection fraction is normal so this is one of a very important determinant of our outcome ejection fraction so if you ask me one single question uh, i mean single investigation if i would like to get in a cardiac patient will be ejection fraction so if patient's left ventricular function is normal that means patient will be able to tolerate any kind of stress happening during surgery or anesthesia so now let's see the question question number 6 and 7 question number 6 monitoring of which ecg lead is most important in intraoperative bleeder lead 1 lead 2 lead v3 and lead v5 so this is something very new so i'll mark with the green color because it's really new thing you know that during ecg i mean during uh, <coughs> during monitoring it's not possible to have have monitoring of 12 lead so normally we are using two leads and two leads which we most commonly use is lead 2 because you know that arrhythmias are best detected in lead 2 now for ischemia we were using v5 so in all your books you will find that for detecting ischemia the best lead mentioned is v5 but that has been changed as per latest studies it has been seen that even v3 is better than v4 and both are better than v5 so for ischemia best lead is either v3 or v4 not v5 so this is something new otherwise traditionally we had always been using lead v5 for detecting ischemia but now they say v3 or v4 are better than v5 were more sensitive than v5 in detecting intraoperative ischemia so answer will be lead v3 question number 7 anesthesia is best maintained on we have already discussed so you you will be able to easily answer it <coughs> this 
ऑक्सीजन नाइट्रोक्साइड हेलोथेन ऑक्सीजन नाइट्रोक्साइड आइसोफ्लोरिन ऑक्सीजन नाइट्रोक्साइड सीओफ्लोरिन ऑक्सीजन नाइट्रोक्साइड डेस्फ्लोरिन फॉर कार्डियक पेशेंट्स आई टोल्ड यू बेस्ट इज आइसोफ्लोरिन बिकॉज इट कॉजेज मिनिमल डिक्रीज इन कार्डिक आउटपुट why i particularly put this question because there is something very new which has come up and that is that isofluorine does not produce coronary steel you would have read that isofluorine and commonly you will read uh, in your books that it is given that isofluorine is the inhalation agent of choice for all cardiac patient except mi because in mi patients it can cause coronary steel that is why we were not using isofluorine for mi patients other cardiac patients we were using but recent studies have proven that isofluorine does not cause coronary steel so can be used safely even for mi patient so that's again something new so you can expect a question on this question number 8 75 year old patient who has undergone stenting stenting with drug eluded stent 7 days back is posted for knee replacement regarding timing of surgery patient can undergo surgery patient can undergo surgery with high risk postpone the surgery for 3 months postpone the surgery for 6 months again <clears throat> there are major changes which has happened so i have uh, put this question forward see if a patient develops mi there are very high chances that he will develop a re mi in surgery the reason being is because surgery and anesthesia is a big stress very stressful condition so that can precipitate mi and studies have shown that if you do surgery within a month the chances of re mi can be as high as 30 to 40% so we have to defer elective surgery now how long we should defer elective surgery that depends how mi was managed so mi would have been either managed conservatively or would have been managed with a stent stenting now stenting you know can be bare metal or can be drug eluded or third is patient has undergone bypass surgery so there are only three ways to ma uh, manage mi so depending on the method mi was managed we will defer the elective surgery if mi was managed conservatively then we have to defer elective surgery for 8 weeks or you can say 2 months 2 months and why i use green pen because in books you will see it is given that if mi was managed conservatively uh, elective surgery should be deferred for 6 weeks but now they change it to 8 weeks bare metal again i'll use green pen because now it is one month four weeks previously they used to say six weeks now four weeks drug eluded again i will use green pen because now they say six months while in books you will see it has been given that if a patient was managed with drug eluded stent you have to defer elective surgery for one year and why we actually defer surgery for such a long period if patient has drug eluded stent because these patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy so if you stop antiplatelet and before surgery you have to stop antiplatelet otherwise patient will bleed so if you stop antiplatelet there can occur stent thrombosis and you know that stent thrombosis is more dangerous than mi so we cannot stop both antiplatelets that is clopidogrel and aspirin for at least 6 months after 6 months the newer stent they undergo complete epitheliation so we can stop so we can 
uh, <coughs> stop so we can take the patient for surgery if undergone bypass surgery then we have to defer for six weeks the recommendation is same so i didn't change the pan conservatively eight weeks bare metal four weeks although nobody is using bare metal nowadays you know drug eluting stent we have to defer for six months and bypass surgery six weeks so now this patient had drug eluting stent and that was done just one week before so of course and it's elective surgery knee replacement so we have to postpone the surgery for six months question number nine <clears throat> a 26 year female suffering from uh, pih has to undergo lscs due to fetal distress anesthesia of choice spinal epidural combined spinal epidural ga now again this is a new change so i included this question previously for pih patients we were not giving a spinal why because pih patients we believe they are uncontrolled hypertension so as often spinal they are going sudden hypotension so in books you will find that it is given that for pih patients anesthesia of choice is epidural ga you know that we avoid for pregnant patients because uh, this pregnant patient they are eight times riskier for aspiration as compared to normal patients and in a pih patient you can expect pulmonary edema also that also is a relative contraindication for intubation so leftover choice was epidural but practically epidural is not possible because epidural take at least 15 to 20 minutes to have onset of action and during emergency cesarean we cannot wait for 15 to 20 minutes so it is a fetal distress means emergency so we were actually giving a spinal i had been giving a spinal for decades for pih patient and uh, but the problem is uh, if something doesn't come in literature uh, you can't say that's uh, right or wrong but now it is uh, proven that spinal can be safely given for pih patients obviously still they are prone for hypertension but uh, epidural since not feasible and ga very risky so still we go with the spinal so now for ph patient it is official unofficially we are giving for decades but now officially they say that for pih patients we can anesthesia of choice will be spinal not epidural question number 10 a 50 year female is posted for pyridectomy she is known case she is a known case of hypertension for 5 years on ebesartan Regarding her anti-hypertensive medication, stopped immediately, dose reductions are required, continued only omitting the morning dose, stop a day before surgery. This is again a major change, so I have included this question. You know, recommendations for anti-hypertensive was that continue all anti-hypertensive except AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers which we used to omit on the day of surgery and why we were omitting on the day of the surgery because it has been seen in studies that if you don't omit patient can develop significant hypotension so we were omitting uh, ac inhibitors ac inhibitors means enalapril captopril panidopril or <clears throat> this receptor blockers that is ebesartan telmisartan these we were omitting on the day of the surgery but now our latest recommendation is that not only uh, on the day of surgery we have to stop them at least a day before surgery 24 hours before surgery so as per current recommendation both ac inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers they should be stopped 24 hours before surgery fine so will be stopped a day before surgery d not a desirable ventilator setting for covid induced ARDS this is very important cardio volume 10 ml per kg fi 80 8200 plateau pressure 35 to 40 none of the above so this is again very important 
particularly during COVID, rather it become more important that for ARDS and it's not only for actually COVID induced ARDS for otherwise also ARDS we have to go for lung protective strategy so definitely <coughs> you can expect question on lung protective strategy lung protective strategy the most important component of lung protective strategies are that we should use low tidal volume. Low tidal volume means 4 to 6 ml per kg of predicted body weight, not the patient actual body weight. What should be the predicted body weight for this uh, height that we have to calculate? So, 4 to 6 ml per kg of predicted body weight. Then plateau pressure. Should be less than 30 centimeter of water. This is the most important component I will say. Plateau pressure. Now why we choose plateau pressure? Because you very well know that Plateau pressure is the pressure at alveolar level and bare, this plateau pressure will be responsible for barotrauma. Barotrauma occurs at the alveolar level, alveolar damage. So obviously we want, we monitor the pressure at alveolar level. So plateau pressure should be less than 30. Then Peep, we already have discussed positive and expiratory pressure. So one of the disadvantage of positive and expiratory pressure is that <coughs> it is increasing intrathoracic pressure. So increase in intrathoracic pressure <coughs> will increase the risk of barotrauma. So they say start with minimum peep. Start with the 5 cm of water and then accordingly titrate. So, all these three modalities are done to prevent barotrauma or you can say injury to the lung, ventilator induced lung injury, uh, <coughs> injury to the lung because which may manifest as pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, surgical emphysema, air embolism, pneumopericardium, pneumoperitoneum because of the positive pressure ventilation. So low tidal volume, 4 to 6 ml per kg, plateau pressure less than 30 and PEEP minimal start with 5 and titrate is to prevent barotrauma. So other than preventing barotrauma, we should protect lung against higher oxygen, hyperoxia, FiO2. FiO2 is the oxygen delivered so it should be less than 0.6. In fact, some say less than 0.5. Some studies say less than 0.5 because you know that oxygen can also cause lung injury which can precipitate or which can behave like ARDS. So now we can see not a desirable. Tidal volume data, yes, not desirable. FiO2 data, not desirable. Plateau pressure more than 30 not desirable so none of the above is a desired ventilator setting for ARDS not only COVID induced I told you otherwise for ARDS also. Now advantage of high flow nasal cannula are all except humidified oxygen positive and expiratory pressure increase anatomical data space decrease need for intubation as compared to non-invasive ventilation. Now HFNC again became very popular and I think uh, it has been asked in one of our exam also because it became very very popular during COVID. High flow nasal cannula. So as the name suggests means we are giving very high flow through nasal cannula. So of course it will not be normal nasal cannula. It will be special nasal cannula which can deliver flow as high as 60 liter per minute. It can deliver flow as high as 60 liters per minute. So such high flows, what, were, what are the advantages? Of course, 
if you are delivering such high flow so this high flow will create some positive pressure so that positive pressure will continuously be present in airways so you can say it produces some kind of continuous positive airway pressure or you can say some kind of peep that is positive and expiratory pressure so this continuous pressure will be in alveoli also and positive pressure in alveoli you can say is peep so it provides peep secondly airways are filled with oxygen means co2 has been eliminated co2 eliminated means physiologically it decreases the anatomical dead space so anatomical dead space is not directly but yes what is the consequence of increasing anatomical dead space increase co2 so by decreasing co2 it decreases the anatomical dead space and of course if you are providing such high flow so obviously you have to give the humidified oxygen otherwise patient will not tolerate and hfnc always give humidified oxygen so it produces humidified oxygen yes produces peep yes increase anatomical dead space no it decreases anatomical dead space decrease need for intubation as compared to niv no actually uh, this is i will say controversial controversial because there are some studies which says that decrease the need for intubation and some studies says that is uh, that does not decrease so still i will say it is debatable so although it's not i will say is a correct choice but if you have to choose between c and d then obviously c definitely is not a advantage it rather decrease the anatomical dead space identify classical laryngeal mask airway igel supreme lma pro seal one of a very important advancement in uh, uh, you can say <coughs> modern day equipment is laryngeal mask airway lma and this is a classical lma so it is placed blindly in oral cavity so that this cuff part lies in oral now you inflate this cuff with a large volume of air so what this cuff will do it will seal oropharynx and hypopharynx from all sides now if you ventilate through this tube you can see these holes through these holes air has no option but to go to larynx so you can ventilate the patient with lma so initially when lma was manufactured it was manufactured as an alternative to uh, intubation for failed or difficult intubation if you are not able to intubate no problem you can put laryngeal mask airway as an alternative but over the years when we started to use lma we found it to be so effective method of ventilation that in fact nowadays we are using it as an elective procedure to avoid intubation because intubation you know carries plethora of complications so to avoid that we are electively using laryngeal mask airway <clears throat> so now it is used routinely however one of the biggest disadvantage of classical lma this is classical lma is see it is not blocking esophagus it is just lying over the esophagus like that so air can leak from sides can enter the esophagus increase intragastric pressure increasing the risk of aspiration so classical lma increases the risk of aspiration moreover you are clearly seeing that patient stomach is getting distended you cannot deflate also because to deflate a stomach you have to pass rail tube or suction catheter and from where you will pass your rail tube or suction catheter cuff has occupied the oropharynx so from where your catheter or suction catheter will go so you cannot deflate a stomach also so this problem is not there because nowadays we are using <coughs> second generation lm and second generation lma the advantage is they have given separate port for stomach decompression and the classical example of second generation lma is proseal proseal there is just a separate port for stomach decompression but even far more than proseal we are using igel in india igel so this is actually igel so igel what is the advantage instead of cuff air filled cuff they have a pre filled cuff with gel pre filled gel cuff 
so the advantage is that you need not inflate the cuff so all air cuff related complications like if cuff get deflated uh, lma can obstruct the airway or when you remove the lma patient can bite this cuff damage this cuff so all these cuff related problems are avoided and since it categorizes itself like a second generation lma so there is a separate suction port you can see this hole from this you can pass your suction catheter or riles tube so through this port it will come and you can see this hole through this hole your suction catheter or riles tube it will enter the stomach and you can deflate the stomach this is done to ease of oral intubation ease of nasal intubation both none of the above this you know is mallam putty classification again very favorite again mallam putty questions on mallam putty classification has been frequently asked in your fmg exams very frequently asked so you know that we have to intubate the patient through oral cavity so obviously mouth opening should be adequate then only you will to intubate the patient through oral cavity uh, <clears throat> so this mallam patti classification is basically basically done to assess the mouth opening so what we do we ask the patient to open mouth as wide as possible and looking at the structure seen patient has been categorized into four categories and the structures will not go in the details of course may not be needed for you so structures we see are fascial pillars hard palate soft palate uvula and in modified mallam patti we also see the uh fosses entry point to oropharynx so obviously in grade 1 everything is seen in grade 2 less structures will be seen grade 3 even less structures and grade 4 nothing is seen so obviously in 1 and 2 all structures are seen means mouth opening is adequate you can uh, easily intubate through oral cavity class 3 mouth opening is inadequate so oral intubation will be difficult and in class 4 no structure is seen so obviously oral intubation is not possible at all so either you have to go through nasal route or even if that is not feasible then you have to straight away go for tracheostomy so we can see that mallam patti classification is done to assess the ease of oral intubation a this equipment cannot detect methemoglobinemia 15 minutes cannot detect methemoglobinemia self hemoglobinemia fetal hemoglobin all of the above so this is what this is pulse oximeter one of the most basic you can say equipment for monitoring is pulse oximeter this is just a portable pulse oximeter you can see this is spo2 and this is heart rate fine so one of the major you can say drawbacks of uh, all these pulse oximeters is that they cannot detect abnormal hemoglobins so if patient is having meth hemoglobin self hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin carboxy hemoglobin they will always give you the false values so we can't rely so that's one of a very big you can say disadvantage of uh, <clears throat> all pulse oximeters that they cannot detect abnormal hemoglobins to detect abnormal hemoglobins we need a special kind of oximeter that is called as cooximeter so cooximeter is a special type of oximeter which can detect abnormal hemoglobins fine so this equipment cannot detect meth hemoglobin self hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin or you can say all of them the following graph of capnography represent esophageal intubation recovery of spontaneous breath cardiac oscillations bronchospasm capnography graph are really uh, uh, important and this is actually a big topic so capnography is the measurement of end tidal carbon dioxide along with its graph so the normal graph you know is like this so this is a normal graph for a control breath now abnormal graphs what you see one is this like you see 
a notch here and this is called as curare notch so curare notch indicate that patient is try trying to take a spontaneous breath patient is trying to take a spontaneous breath during control breath so that is represented as curare notch so obviously what you have to do you have to repeat the dose of muscle relaxant curare notch <clears throat> Then other common graphs that you see in COPD or asthma patient, what you see that uh, respiration is prolonged. So graph will be like this. So this you can say shape is like shark fin. So you can say shark fin pattern. So shark fin pattern is CO, seen in COPD or asthma. Then Sometimes if patient is very lean and thin, you see this cardiac oscillations being manifested like this. So this is cardiac oscillation. So this is normal. Most dangerous, I will say that if you see that there is a normal graph going on and then you see that graph become flat line, then it can be really life threatening complications means tube is not in trachea. So which may be because of accidental extubation or tube get disconnected from circuit or tube get obstructed due to secretions or ventilation failure. So flat line is really dangerous <clears throat> because you know that capnography is the surest confirmation of intubation. So in this, yes, this represents <clears throat> curare notch represents recovery of spontaneous breath that is B. Blue vaporizer is off. Thevoflurane, desflurane, halothane, isoflurane. You know that uh, <clears throat> these vaporizers are the equipments which are used for the delivery of inhalation agents and they can be identified from a distance by color. So for sevoflurane, the color they have devised is yellow. For desflurane, blue. For halothane, red. And for isoflurane, purple. So these are the four colors. So blue they have asked. Blue is desflurane. So this one is desflurane. B. Untrue. Most commonly used circuit. Best for neurosurgical patient. Fresh gas flow is 1.6 times a minute volume. None of the above. Circuits you know are very frequently asked. And you should be able to actually identify the circuits. So three commonly used circuits I will tell you is. Meffelson A. That is Megil, also called as Megil. Fresh gas flow is the flow that is minimally required to wash out uh, the patient carbon dioxide. So fresh gas flow for Megil circuit is equal to minute volume. And this we are talking for a spontaneous ventilation patient. So if you are using Megil circuit, Fresh gas flow should be kept equal to minute volume to prevent rebreathing. Then second is Baines. It is a coaxial circuit and this is Baines. You can see coaxial means one tube passing through the other. So this is coaxial, one tube passing through the other. For Baines, it is the circuit of choice for controlled ventilation. Controlled ventilation means you know that uh, ventilator is controlling the ventilation of the patient, controlled ventilation. For controlled ventilation, fresh gas flow should be 1.6 times of minute volume. Third circuit that is <coughs> we are using is Jackson Reese, which is most commonly used pediatric circuit, and fresh gas flow recommendations are similar to Baines. So it behaves like Baines. So, first we can see that this is a Baines circuit, and Baines is most commonly used circuit that is true. Best for neurosurgical. Why? Because you can see this tubing very long. So, and in neurosurgery patient head will be covered. So, you stand far away from the patient. And fresh gas flow should be 1.6 times a minute volume. That is true. So, none of the above. All are true. False statement. Again, this is important. Very important that uh, new change that for adults, 
we use Macintosh laryngoscope blade, which you know is curved blade. And for children of all ages, this is new actually. This I will say is old, same adult. Previously, also we are using Macintosh that is curved blade. Now, for children, they say all age groups, we are using Magill. Not Magill, sorry, Miller. We are using Miller blade. So, this is Miller. Straight with a little curve at the tip. Miller. Previously, you know, in um, for children, you will see for newborns, we are using Magill for infants, Oxford infant, and for uh, uh, small children, adults, uh, uh, Miller and uh, adolescents, Macintosh with small bit. Now everything is removed. Adults, Macintosh and children, Miller. So this is again something very new. You can expect the question. So this is Miller, straight with little curve, used for children less than yes. Yes, and children, why we use prefer a straight blade because we have to lift the epiglottis because epiglottis is anteriorly placed and is used for newborn also, all age groups. I told you so again, none of the above, all statements are correct. Used in obstetric, pediatric, old age patient, gynecological patient. What is this? Antonox, and Antonox is only used for labor analgesia, painless labor. That is the only you can say use. Dentists are also using, but mainly it is used for labor analgesia. So, Antonox is used for obstetric analgesia. Untrue, this is Sevoflurin. Agent of choice for induction is pediatric? Yes. Smoothest induction, so it is the agent of choice for pediatric induction. Convulsions, yes, but uh, very rarely, but yes. Yes, with closed circuit, it can produce compound A. Although the production of compound A is also theoretical, but it can. So, again, none of the above. Contraindicated in pneumothorax, tympanoplasty, diaphragmatic hernia, all of the above. This is nitrous oxide. And why nitrous oxide is contraindicated in pneumothorax or tympanoplasty or diaphragmatic hernia? Because it is 35 times more soluble than air. So, if, <coughs> what do you mean by that? For one mole of, 35 more soluble than nitrogen. So, for one mole of nitrogen removed, will be replaced with 35 molecules of nitrous oxide. So imagine if there is air in pleural cavity, patient is suffering from pneumothorax, one mole of nitrogen is replaced with 35 molecules of nitrous oxide. So that can double or triple the volume of air in, two to, uh, in 10 to 15 minutes. So absolutely contraindicated. Tympanoplasty, middle ear also has air. So increased pressure will lead to displacement of graph. Diaphragmatic hernia, the gut is already in chest cavity and gut also contains air, so it will lead to distension of gust, compression of lung tissue, further leading to hypoxia. So, all of the above. You can reverse all. Bucuronium, rocuronium, atracurium, pancuronium. This is what? Sugamedics. Sugamedics is a newer reversal agent used to, re <coughs> used to reverse only steroidal kind of muscle accent, not benzyl isophilones. And atracurium, you know, is a benzyl isophilone. So it can reverse only steroids. If you don't want to remember that, forget it. You can just remember that Sugamedex is a newer reversal agent for non-depolarizing muscle accent, steroidal type only. For the following situation where there is one resuscitator, the compression to ventilation ratio should be 30 is to 2, 15 is to 2, 30 is to 1, 15 is to 1. So this is again, uh, there is some change you can say. When you are doing CPR, you are doing CPR in two circumstances. Without advanced airway and with with advanced airway. With advanced airway means you have already intubated the patient. Patient may be pediatric or patient may be adult. Without advanced airway means you have not intubated the patient and you are a single sectator. Then ratio will be 30 is to 2 for 
adults as well as pediatrics means you will give 30 compressions go to mouth give two breath come to chest give 30 compressions come to mouth give two breath if you are two resuscitators then this ratio will become 15 is to 2 for pediatric but for adults it will still remain 30 is to 2 so it will always be 30 is to 2 for adults once you have achieved the advanced airway means you have intubated the patient then there are no ratios one person will continue compressions at a rate of 100 to 20 per minute with a breath so compressions 120 per minute and breath is 20 to 30 per minute in pediatric while for adults compression is same compression is 100 to 120 per minute while ventilation is 10 breath per minute same without any synchronization one person will continue compression and second person giving 10 breaths means after every six second he will give one breath while for pediatric it was also same recommendation but in 2020 guidelines they changed so very very important you can definitely expect a question on this most major change uh, <coughs> in uh, CPR in 2020 that for pediatric ventilation rate with advanced airway is 20 to 30 per minute which used to be 10 like adults before 2020 so here what is our question this is adult patient you can see from photo and single resuscitator so for adult it is always 30 is to 2 whether single or uh, <clears throat> 2 on which principle the following device functions bore effect pulse effect venture effect boils principle what is this you should know that this is venture mass this they are want to ask venture mass you should be able to identify and the advantage of venture mask is that it deliver uh, fixed oxygen means here you can see they are using green device so means patient is definitely receiving 60 if you are using orange patient will be receiving 34 if you are using white your patient is receiving 28 like that so fixed oxygen so this is venturi effect venturi mass obviously working with the venturi effect and that's it <clears throat> of course it is not possible to cover whole anesthesia and an r but i try to cover the most important questions or the most expected questions based on the current trend i told you and based on your previous questions so still you have any query no problem <coughs> you are always most welcome to post your queries on eGurukul and we try to help and solve them as early as possible and thank you very much for joining and my best wishes for you.